great when a hymn can bring someone to mind. It's almost for like a second they're back. And I, I thought that was really special that we got to sing it, that, uh, the chorus of that hymn one extra time. And that's, that's really neat. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to Judges chapter 10? Judges chapter 10 will be our text for tonight with possible or very likely gusts up to chapter 11. We've been systematically, verse by verse or passage by passage, going through the book of Judges. It's been an awesome and encouraging study for me, and I, I hope it has for you as well. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever had that kind of friend? The kind of friend that seems to distance him or himself or herself, the kind of friend that doesn't really pay you much attention until they need something. You ever had that friend? Are you that friend? Right. Tonight, we're going to see that the people of Israel oftentimes had very little use for God until they suffered. And then they would come to him and ask him to make their lives better. And we're going to see tonight that God says something that we would never expect. He says, no. Before that, let's pray. Now, before we pray, I also, since Steve Nace, you know, uh, was honest and forthright about forgetting the scripture reading this morning, I feel convicted that I totally forgot to pray for the VBS workers and so um, I'm inspired by his example. So let's pray for them as well. Dear Heavenly Father, we are not good friends to you. We use you. And when we get what we ask from you, we run from you. We delight so much more in the gift than the giver. And it's embarrassing. Dear Heavenly Father, why are you ever good to us? It seems like the second you are, we drift. Could it be that like the sons of Israel, you can't bear to see us miserable? Oh, Lord, you're so gracious to us. Would you help us? that you would be our first thought, not our last resort. That you would be the one we run to instead of the one we've run from. And Lord, the book of Judges is so full of bad examples. Would you help us to glean some good help from these bad examples? Now, Lord, we also pray for Vacation Bible School this week. We pray for the workers. We thank you for Summer and her hard work and dedication and all those that are leading and helping with her. Lord, we pray that you would grant life to someone's soul through this ministry. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever heard the expression, a friend in need is a friend indeed? Have you ever heard that before? What that expression means is that people are a lot friendlier to you when you have something for them. In fact, because of that, a famous theologian, okay, not a famous theologian, somebody nobody knows, once told me that a friend in need is what? A pest. That's what he said. A friend in need is a pest, he said. And there is some truth to that, all jokes aside. There is, in, in many of our experiences, either we are that person or we have that person that tends to forget about us until they need something from us. Sometimes they're unintended leeches that just want to draw grace from us but never give grace to us. And so what will we see tonight? We will see that our first love is often our last resort. Let me ask you this. How many times have you prayed only when you have exhausted every other option? I mean, don't we do that? Don't we try to fix things ourselves? Don't we try to outthink things, outdo things? And finally, when our incompetence is exposed, we say, all right, 
I guess we should pray. Why is prayer so rarely our first inclination instead of our last resort? We'll also see tonight that old, ugly, vicious cycle in the book of Judges that once they get blessed, they get complacent. Once they get complacent, they go running after other gods. Once they go running after other gods, they are punished by the true God. And once they are punished by the true God, they repent. Or at least they seem to. Now, the, fir- the next thing we'll, we'll just glance at by introduction are two minor judges. Would you look with me at chapter 10, starting in verse 1? It says, Now after Abimelech died, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, arose to save Israel. And he lived in Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years, then he died and was buried in Shamir. And we know nothing else about him. Now, what we discovered earlier on in the study of the book of Judges is no news is kind of good news because the book of Judges focuses on bad examples and war. And so with these minor judges, they probably had pretty quiet, beautiful, peaceful lives. And so because of that, they don't get as much pub as the Samsons of the book of Judges or the Gideons or the Jephthahs. The other one we'll see is Jair the Gileadite, and he arose and judged Israel 22 years. Now, the the author of the book of Judges tells us something about him, and so this should pique our interest. It says in verse 4, he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities in the land of Gilead that are called Havoth Jair to this day, and Jair died and was buried. So there must be something significant about the fact that they had 30 cities. Well, there is. They were 30 cities in the land of Gilead, right? Well, we're going to see that Jephthah factors large because he's from the household of Gilead, okay? So the first thing we're going to see is this sentiment expressed from God. Okay, so now you love me. Notice then in verse 6 that Israel again rejected the Lord and began to serve other gods. This is mind-numbing to us, isn't it? How Israel continually goes to the Baals and the Ashtaroths of the foreign nations instead of the real, true, glorious God that they've served? How on earth can they so continually, so habitually stray from the true God? Well, how could we? Yeah, we do. And lest we get frustrated with Israel, a a very important person once said, whenever you point at somebody else, look what you got. Three fingers pointing right back at you. That's why I point like this. That's how I point. Just to protect myself from that. We see in Israel that they seem continually, systematically addicted to false gods. Now, what's the problem with false gods? Well, two problems. Ready? One, they're false. (laughs) And two, they can't do anything. So in verse 6, notice that in serving the other gods, they had rejected the Lord. It says this, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. As we learned long ago, Baals were gods of war and victory in war, and the Ashtaroth were goddesses of fertility. Now, when Israel started to coast, when they started to feel blessed, they still felt a need to win wars and defend themselves and have children. So they drifted to these Baals and Ashtaroth. Now, notice what it says. The gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the sons of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines. You know what all these places have in common? They were Israel's enemies. They, like a moth to the flame, were attracted to false gods. Then look in verse 6. Thus they forsook the Lord 
and did not serve him. Now, I'm convinced that in their mind, they thought they were adding other gods to Yahweh. And the reason why I believe this is because Yahweh is where they go when they're in trouble. Yahweh was the Lord of hosts, of angel armies. And they thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll love him, and we'll love the Baals, and we'll love the Ashtaroth, and we'll love everybody, and we'll get all the benefits. The problem is, is that our God is a jealous God in the highest and holiest sense of that word. He will not share his glory with another. We must worship him and no one else, or we cannot walk with him. He refuses to share his glory and the affection of his people. So in serving them, they were rejecting him. Notice that there's definitely a lesson here. If we want God to join our team, we'll never have him. We must join his we, if we ask God to change his nature, to love what we love, he will never do it. He tells us to change our nature and love what he loves, and he even gives us the ability to do it. So what happens in verse 7? Understandably, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, and into the hands of the sons of Ammon. He gave them away to the peoples whose gods they loved. It's as if God said, do you want Ammonite worship? Be slaves of the Ammonites. It's as if God says, if you want to serve the Baals, might as well be the slaves of the Philistines. What we love, if it's not God, hinders our walk with God. So God gets angry and he sold the people like slaves into the hands of their enemies. And one after another, the people fell victim to the Philistines and Ammonites for 18 years. It's a long time. Now notice then, beloved, what happens. In the end of verse 9, it says this, the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was greatly distressed. Now whenever you see a phrase like that in the Bible, that Israel was greatly distressed, bells should start going off in your mind. We don't like it when Israel is distressed. God does not like it when Israel is distressed. Israel is the covenant people of God. Israel is the apple of his eye. Israel are the people chosen to represent him in the Old Testament dispensation. He does not let them rot. And so in verse 10, the sons of Israel cry, I'm sorry, the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, "We have sinned against you." For indeed, we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. Verse 11, the Lord said to the sons of Israel, didn't I deliver you from Egypt? The Egyptians, the Amorites, the sons of Ammon and the Philistines and the Sidonians and the Amalekites and the Mayanites, which is very close to Mayonnaise, so they must have been sinister. It scares me a little bit. God says this to us. How many things have I delivered you out of? And yet you run to them. The Bible says, like a dog returns to his own vomit, Israel long for her idols, and we long for our sins. God says to them, I delivered you from all these things. Verse 12, 
Then in verse 13, he says this, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Look at this. Therefore, I will no longer deliver you. God says no. Really? God says, I have delivered you from the Egyptians, the Ammonites, the Amalekites, from Manes. And you love their gods, not your God. No. Verse 14, go and cry out to them. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. You hear what he's saying? He's saying when you want children, you go to the Ashtaroth. When you want safety, you go to the Baals. Go to them now. Paul asked, Paul asked this question. What benefit did you derive from the sins of which now you are ashamed? When our lives are wrecked and we look up to God and we say, God, help me. What would it be like if he said, well, I thought you sought joy in money or pleasure or food or drugs, entertainment, whatever. Go to them. Why can't Israel go to their foreign fake gods? Because they are fake and because they are useless, just like the sins that so easily entangle us. Notice there's two levels of repentance seen in this passage. First is they're admitting in verse 10, look, we've sinned. But notice in verse 16, it goes even further. It says, so they put away the foreign gods from among them and they serve the Lord. And look at this. And he could bear their misery. He could bear the misery of Israel no longer. This God, this God cannot bear your broken, repentant heart. He can't bear it because he loves you as the apple of his eye, just like he loved Israel. When they broke, when they repented, God's like, I can't take this anymore. How does God respond when we repent? He does the unthinkable. He abandons us temporarily to the gods we love. And then he does the unthinkable again. He brings us back to him. Now, would you turn with me to Hosea chapter 2, Verse 5, one of my dreams, and I'll, I'll do it eventually, is to teach the book of Hosea. I've tried a couple of times in the past, but it's, it's difficult and, and long. If ever I do, it, the title of the series is going to be No Way Hosea. That's what I've, that's all I got so far. But the story of Hosea is a really important one. He tells his prophet to marry a prostitute. And he tells his prophet to marry a prostitute as an illustration of how God treats the unrighteous people of Israel. And notice what we find in Hosea chapter 2. Starting in verse 5, beloved, I just want to read this to you. Let this wash over you. Also, I'm going to do, in verse 4, he said that he, he would punish Israel. In verse 5, it says this, For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up her way with thorns. I'll build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. And she will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my husband. Who's that? God. 
And she'll say, for it was better for me then than now. For she does not know that it was I, God said, who gave her the grain, the new new wine and the oil, and lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain at harvest time. And my new wine in its season. I will also take away my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. See what he's doing? He's saying, I'm going to remove from her the things that she delights in. Then I will uncover her lewdness and so on and so forth. Verse 14 then. In verse 13, it says that she forgot the Lord. Look what he says in verse 14. Then behold, I will allure her. Bring her back into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her vineyards. Verse 16, it will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me Ishi, my husband, and will no longer call me Baali, my Lord. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth so that they will be mentioned no more. Verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in loving kindness and compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. You see the point? God says that no matter how bad Israel gets, He will abandon her to her sins, but then he will win her back. God is a better friend to Israel than Israel has ever been to him. And now we're going to see the same thing in Jephthah. Starting in chapter 11, verse 1, Now Jephthah the Gileadite, again, see, Gilead, was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you're the son of another woman. You hear what they're saying? They're saying, Jephthah, you're not good enough to be our brother. Get out. Problem is, Jephthah was a mighty, mighty warrior. So then the war comes, and they start to say, you know what would be really good if we had Jephthah? So what do they do? Just like they treated God, they treated Jephthah. And they go back to him, and they go, come back. And you know what? Brother, come on back. You can even lead. See, he wasn't good enough to be their brother, but all of a sudden he's good enough to be their leader. Why? Because they needed a warrior. They didn't care about Jephthah. They needed him, so they used him. Now notice that Jephthah's called back, and and notice how he responds. I I love this. Jephthah goes to a place named Tov, which means good, and he finds all these worthless fellows. So he goes to a place named good and finds all the bad people. And then they come to him in verse 6, and they said They say to Jephthah, come and be our chief that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, for this reason we've now returned to you that you may go with us and fight. You see what they're saying? Jephthah's like, what, now now I'm important to you? And they say, yeah, because we need you to fight our battles. Notice that Jephthah asked them, will I really be your leader? I, who was not worthy to be your brother, I'm really going to be your leader? And they said, yes. And so he says, then later, then the Lord will be witness against us. I will come and lead you. Let me ask you this. Do any of you like being used? I mean, have you ever, have you ever said to, to your spouse, you know, so-and-so is a really great friend to me. 
they really take as much as they could possibly take? No. Jephthah knows he's not being respected. He's being manipulated. He's being used. But he's so desperate to be received by his brothers that he takes a fool's errand. He takes the lead in a military endeavor that without him they would have lost. So then Jephthah talks to the enemies, and he tries to get to the heart of the problem. And we'll move real quickly through this because our time is, is running short, and I don't want to burden you with too much. But notice that Jephthah takes the time to understand the problem. Notice in verse 12, Jephthah sent messengers to the kings or to the king of the sons of Ammon, saying, What is between you and me that you have come to me to fight against my land? See, you notice that Jephthah takes the time to ask the question. That shows wisdom. I mean, after all, maybe the fight can be averted. Maybe the fight is unnecessary, and as we'll see, it really is. And they say, in response to this, that that you have some of our land. And Jephthah goes, are you crazy? We won this land because the people of the land would not receive us. And so we came back, and we won the land by military conquest. And uh, it was 300 years ago. He's saying, you have no right to claim this land. So Jephthah takes the time to explain his perspective. And then notice in verse 28, I know I skipped that part, but you will, you'll be able to read it and go back. In verse 28, he says, but the kings of the son of Ammon disregarded the message which Jephthah sent to him. See, they didn't answer him. They just ignored him. What can we glean from this, brothers and sisters? First of all, let me ask this question. Why does God let us have good times? Now, I, I know why he lets us have bad times. That's crystal clear in my experience and in the Bible. He lets us have bad times because those times push us to him, right? Right? I mean, when you're struggling, don't you go to God? like Israel did? Isn't that the best? Don't you feel closest to him when you are relying on him for every breath and every beat of your heart? When things go well for us, we tend to forget about God. When things are going poorly for us, we are quick to rush to God for the help that only he can provide. So why does God ever let us have good times? Another question. Why does God show such mercy to us? Could it be that God simply cannot endure our misery? Could it be that he looks at us and says, I can't take it anymore. They must be won back to me. Could it be that the chastening and discipline that we ourselves deserve from God puts us in such a position that the very God who is striking us has pity on us? If so, what does this tell us about this God? It tells us that he is remarkably gracious forgiving, merciful, and kind. What does this tell us about ourselves? It tells us we're lousy friends. That we use God. And if we're honest, sometimes we may even wonder that what Satan said about Job may be true of us. Or Satan told God that if you withdraw your blessings from Job, he will curse you to your face. What would our lives be like if God treated us the way we deserve?
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, that our distress, our misery draws out gracious thoughts from your heart. Somewhere along the line, we have just become convinced that you're always angry with us. Yet we see in this passage another example of how when Israel is at their worst, instead of drawing your absolute wrath, it draws out kindness, compassion, grace. So, Lord, we ask two things. We ask that you would hide our sins from your sight. that you would look away from our record of idolatry and our addiction to that which is false. We know you've done that in Christ for those of us who are believers. And we ask, secondly, that you would draw us to yourselves that you would draw us in such a way that we find more pleasure, more delight, more happiness in obedience to you than in the rebellion of the pleasures of the world. Lord, make us beneficiaries of your graciousness. We beg you, despite the fact that we are fair weather friends, to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.